Welcome to Teaching Tolerance and Understanding. Our first webinar from Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. My name is Holly Dotson and I am the Education Coordinator with CBLDF. Uh, CBLDF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the First Amendment rights of the comic art form and its community of retailers, creators, publishers, librarians, and teachers. The CBLDF provides legal referrals, representation, advice, assistance, and education in furtherance of these goals. We are a small organization that is directly supported by the contributions of our members and donors. If you can make a monetary contribution, please consider signing up for membership or making a donation um, to one of our pre for one of our premium, premium items. If you are unable to make a contribution, you can still help by spreading the word, following us on Twitter, Facebook, and distributing our literature in your communities. We are going to get started. Um, I will, uh, before I introduce our speakers, I'm going to let you know how our webinar is going to run. We are going to um, have them talk. I'm going to mute myself so you won't see me anymore after I introduce our speakers. And then um, if you all see, there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, as they are um, carrying out the discussion, I will be posting um, resources that are relevant to the discussion. So I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. First, we have Betsy Gomez. She is the Band Books Week Coalition Coordinator and former editorial director for CBLDF. She manages resources and editorial content for bandbooksweek.org and continues to advise CBLDF on educational matters. She is the editor of CBLDF's book about the women who changed free expression in comics. CBLDF presents She Changed Comics with an extensive background in educational publishing, Gomez has worked as a content developer and editor for several companies, including Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. <laughs> Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Yeah, they got stuck <laughs> in my mouth there. Here's in education, among others. Her work combines her love of comics with her passion for education and the right to read. And we are so happy to have her today. Hey, buddy. <laughs> And our second speaker is Jean Luen Yang, and he is the National Book Award nominated creator of American Born Chinese and Boxers and Saints. He has also written comics based on Nickelodeon's popular Avatar, The Last Airbender cartoon, the computer coding mystery series Secret Coders, and several titles for DC Comics, including Superman, New Superman, and The Terrifics. Yang teaches creative writing for Hamline University's MFA in Writing for Children and Young Adults, founded the Reading Without Walls program, and was named the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature by the Library of Congress in 2006. He has been a member of CBLDF's Board of Directors since 2018. So welcome, Jean. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for everyone for coming, virtually coming. <laughs> I'm going to mute myself and let these two carry on their conversations. And again, be looking for the resources, um, everyone, in the chat button that will also be available um, as part of the file that will be sent to you after the webinar um, is finished tomorrow. All right. All right. Thanks for the introduction, Holly. Um, just a really quick kind of format thing. Um, if y'all could uh, hold off on your questions until the last 15 minutes, we'll have a Q&A at that point in time, and you can send them to us in the Q&A panel. Um, uh, if you send them to us earlier, we'll probably miss the questions, and we'll do our best to answer as many of the questions as possible. Uh, with that, Jean, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. I know you're a super busy guy, and uh, it's asking a lot, but we do really appreciate you being here today. I'm super happy to be here. I'm uh, thrilled to be a part of CBLEF. I, I, I've admired the organization for a long time, so when you all asked me to be part of the board, I jumped at the chance. I think um, we're doing some important work. And thank you for your time, too. I know you're super busy, too. <laughs> well, thanks, Gene, and thanks, uh, thanks for being a member of our board of directors. Your input is immensely important to us, and your support of our mission to protect uh, free expression is also massively important. So let's get started. Let's talk about comics. Um, let's warm up with a, with a softball. What was your first comic? The very first comic book in my collection was uh, DC Comics Presents, number 58. It was a Superman comic with the Atomic Knights as the guest stars. You know who the Atomic Knights are? 
Uh, I have a passing idea of who they are. I actually came to comics kind of late, so I'm still catching up. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, they're they're kind of obscure. They're obscure DC comic skaters. They basically dress up like medieval knights and then ride around giant mutated dogs. <laughs> nice. It was a really exciting book. Really I'm totally exciting. gonna. I'm gonna have to find that now. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Can I ask which one was yours? Okay, so um, my first kind of real comic was actually Sandman, um, and it was because uh, I came to comics in college, and my friends were all comic book nerds, and, and they're like, you should read comics, and they're like, they gave me a copy of Sandman, it was, uh, I think, issue 18 with the uh, adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream, Yeah, yeah. and they're like, first one's free, and uh, it, was, it was all downhill from there. <laughs> so you started at a really high bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. kind of set that bar a little high. Um, but, you know, upon reflection, when I was a kid, I did have an adaptation of The Secret of Nim, where they basically oh, took okay. movie skills and, like, made him into a comic. And I yeah. do remember having that as a kid, and I read it so often, the cover fell off. I think pages were missing. Um, it was held together with tape. So, you know, I did... It wasn't that I didn't experience comics as a kid. I just didn't have the opportunity to really get into them until yeah. I was in college. <laughs> so, but enough about me. Let's talk about you some more. Um, why did you decide on comics as your medium for creative expression? Why did you decide to start making them? I, I love comics with like a pretty logical love. You know, I think I, I, I started loving comics first and then I came up with cognitive reasons why I should. But one of the things I really appreciate about comics is this combination of words and pictures. Uh, I think there are just some kinds of information that are better conveyed through words and some kinds of information that are better conveyed through pictures. And with comics, you get both of those options. And then as a creator as well, I feel like, you know, I'm okay at writing and I'm okay at drawing. And really in comics, I can use one to kind of cover up for the other sometime, you know? <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, um, I mean, obviously it's working for you. You only have like a couple of National Book Award finalist nominations, so. Things are kind of crazy, I gotta tell you. <laughs> like, I started in comics in the mid to late 90s and to go from there to here, not just for me personally, but for comics in general, yeah. has been kind of crazy, right? Like everybody knows what a graphic novel is. That's yeah. Thing. <laughs> no, it's been amazing to see uh, the growth of the, uh, of the medium. Uh, over time and its acceptance as, a, as an art form. So, um, and part of that is because of the work you do, um, because your books are so amazing and also because of some of the initi initiatives you started, which uh, kind of brings us to Reading Without Walls. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about? Yeah, Reading Without Walls uh, is a program that started uh, with my ambassadorship. So for 2016, 2017, I was the national ambassador for young people's literature. It's a program that is run through the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. Out of all of my jobs that I've ever had in my whole life, that is the one with the longest name, you know, with the most syllables, <laughs> like the famous title I've ever had. And it was super fun. The, the mission of the position is to get more kids reading and to get kids reading more. So every ambassador, it, it's not a really long program. It's, it's only been in existence since 2008, I believe. Uh, Don Cheska was the very first one. I think I was the first like graphic novelist, graphic novelist, although my immediate pre predecessor, Kate DiCamillo, had done a hybrid book before where she had used both prose and comics to tell a story. Um, but every ambassador has, has a two-year term and we all choose a platform. We choose like some kind of focus uh, for our two years. And for me, I chose Reading Without Walls. So by that, I mean, uh, I want to get kids to read outside of their comfort zones, to explore the world through books. You know, I think, I think a lot of us, when we go into our local library, we gravitate towards one section of the library. And, and that's a really good thing. I think it's awesome when you have a home in the library. But at the same time, there's a, a bunch of stuff outside of your favorite section that deserves to be read that might even become your new favorite. So I wanted to, to find some way of encouraging kids to do that. Uh, the way the program works is it takes the form of a challenge. You can do it either as an individual or as a community. You just set a due date for yourself. And by that due date, you do one of three things. Number one, you read a book about a character who doesn't look like you or live like you. Or two, you read a book about a topic that you might not know anything about. Or three, you read a book in a format that you don't normally read for fun. So if normally all you read are novels for fun, I want you to try a graphic novel. And if normally all you read are graphic novels and comics, then I want you to try something with no pictures, like 
uh, a novel or a collection of poetry or even an audio book. If you really want to go for the gold, you find one book to fit all three of the criteria. So we've run it. Like originally it was going to end with the end of my ambassadorship at the end of 2017, but the program ended up getting so much momentum behind it that we've continued it. So Macmillan, my publisher, is the, the big force behind it. And they've put together a website, readingwithoutwalls.com. Uh, if you want to run it with the kids in your life, go on the website. There are all sorts of printable materials that you can use to get started. Did you, uh, did you do anything in particular for this year's event or... Uh, we did some online promotions. I asked some of my favorite authors to um, write lists of their favorite Reading Without Walls type books, and, and they did. It was great. Um, and then I, I did a couple of speaking engagements. It definitely was not as intense as when I was doing my <laughs> back production, but it's, it's still run. And, 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 you know, some of it is that um, librarians and, and bookstore owners are just doing it now, you know, without yeah. any sort of prompting. One of the most gratifying pieces of uh, feedback that we got is that reading without walls ended up being a way of moving books that wouldn't normally move in either a library yeah. or uh, a bookstore. You know, it gave um, it gave the librarians uh, a, a reason to pull out books that don't necessarily circulate well within their community uh, and and turn them into you know books that do circulate well. Great, great. Thank you, Jean. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the use of comics as, as tools for tolerance um, and how they can be used to address these kind of tough topics and challenging concepts uh, that kids often encounter in school, in classrooms, in life. Uh, let's talk about kind of the advantages of using comics uh, to teach about these tough topics. So, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big yeah. fan of Scott McCloud. I think I read his Understanding Comics book, like right, right when I like went from 19 to 20, you know, like when your brain is super impressionable. So he, <laughs> like, I think in a very McCloudian way, and in, in that book, in Understanding Comics, he does have this one chapter where he talks about the power of the cartoon, meaning the power of the simplified image. And he talks about how like a smiley face, two dots and a line representing the mouth could really represent anybody, right? The, the simpler you make an image, the more universal it becomes. And, and that is one of the powers of comics that I think is very powerful, especially when you talk about building empathy. You know, when you're reading uh, stories about, uh, you know, that, that feature these simplified characters, in some ways it may be easier for you to put yourself in those characters' shoes. That's, that's actually something um, that, you know, my, my Asian American friends and I talk about sometimes. We wonder if, uh, I, I think it's definitely different now. I think America is different now. But when we started maybe 20 years ago, we wondered if it was easier for um, like an American audience to accept a cartooned, Asian protagonist as opposed to uh, like a live action Asian American protagonist on the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in, uh, in previous conversations, we've talked about um, how the most effective comics for social issues put the emphasis not on the detail, but yeah. on distilling That's human right. emotion. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's right. I, I mean, I, I think um, I, there's always this balance. Whenever you're doing stories in general, you want to balance the familiar with the fantastic or the expected with the unexpected, right? And, and comics, because it's a simplified form, the, the simplification can be a way of building that familiarity. Because it's simplified, because the world is simplified, anybody can put themselves within that environment. And then once they're in, then you start introducing the, the unfamiliar stuff. So how about you? Have you, have you noticed any, uh, any books that, that do that particularly well? Any graphic novels that do that particularly well? I mean, your books. <laughs> <laughs> that um, was not what I was going for. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> it was not a setup for that. No, absolutely. I think uh, your books, Raina Tagemeyer's books immediately come to mind because, um, you know, I think that the books that I think have, at least that I've read that have like kind of the largest kind of impact, especially when it deals with tough topics are the books where I can see myself in them. Yeah. Um, and when you have a more generalized drawing, um, you know, I think that that helps so that somebody can emphasize or empathize with the characters um, more effectively. 
Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the book looks simple, but when you get down to it, the ideas in there are very complex, very engaging and uh, very important to get across. So, yeah. um, that's one of the, I'd like American born Chinese and boxers and saints are books that I like recommend <laughs> like on a loop. I'm sure my yeah. friends are getting tired yeah. of me saying, Hey, you should read this. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, books that, um, make these tough topics accessible in a way that students can kind of self-motivate. Um, that they can relate to just kind of um, uh, because it makes the topic palatable and understandable in a way that they can't get otherwise in prose. Um, and so there's a lot of YA and uh, younger readers comics coming out right now that are, are really doing, I think, a very good job of, of engaging students um, in empathy in recognizing themselves, recognizing other populations. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think there are a lot of, we're seeing more, because my background's in STEM, we're seeing more books that, that focus on STEM topics, mm -hmm. on the scientists behind the science, on about the science itself. You're even doing a series called Secret Coders that talks about computer coding, which is something that kids are really into and yeah. have been into for some time. So, so let's talk about your books then. Let's talk about how your books deal specifically with tough topics and, and kind of complex ideas. Let's start with the American born Chinese. What are some of the tough topics covered in that? Sure. With American born Chinese, I, I began that book when I was maybe five years into making comics. I definitely wasn't making money at it yet, but um, I was, I, I had been making them for a while and I'd always had these Asian American protagonists, but I'd never talked about the Asian American experience head on. So I wanted to do that, you know, because um, my own cultural heritage is such an important part of how I define myself and how I find my place in the world. I wanted something where that was central. So I came up with these three different story ideas. I couldn't decide which one was the best. So in the end, I decided to weave them all together. So American Born Chinese, if you haven't read it, it has three different storylines and they kind of they kind of come together. Um, and and really, the, I, I guess the, 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 the most controversial part of that book really is how I do deal with stereotypes. So stereotypes, I think uh, if, if you're a my, if there's anything that makes you different from the majority at your school as a kid, you will probably encounter stereotypes. Well, people, people will come to you with preconceived notions about who you are and what you're good at and, and, and what you might care about. Uh, so I wanted to deal with that head on. And the way I did that was I created a character named Cousin Chinky who is basically a walking, talking stereotype. And he is meant to be offensive. Like as soon as you see him on the page, he's supposed to, he's supposed to rile you up a little bit, you know? And, and, uh, and that is definitely like, if people complain about American more Chinese, that is most likely what they'll complain about is that particular yeah. character. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit um, about kind of how you counter those those complaints here in a sec. But, um, you know, I would add uh, just my in my reading of American Born Chinese is that I think that it's a very good volume for addressing um, kind of ideas of immigration and acceptance and finding your place in the world, especially when you're an outsider in a new space. Um, are there kind of other themes that you see in it um, that I'm overlooking? Um, I think I think there is a. Uh, this is something that I, I've talked with uh, Vera Brazgol about uh, as well. She um, did a book called Anya's Ghost, which also deals with very similar topics. So she she like me, she's she's the uh, child of immigrants, and I think there's this thing that happens where um, there's almost like a the immigrant's child's guilt, you know? Yeah. Like you don't like when when you're an immigrant's kid, you don't you didn't go through the direct hardships that your immigrant parents went through, right? And then you also have um, a leg up on them uh, in terms of understanding the, the culture that surrounds you. And there's something a little bit weird about that. There's something a little bit weird about understanding something that your parents don't or and, and may never be able to. And, and sometimes the way we deal with that immigrant guilt is we take it out on kids that we see as even more immigranty than us, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so one of the central relationships in American born Chinese is between two characters that are like that. So the, the main character, Jin, he was born in the United States. So he's the child of an immigrant. And then his best friend and sometimes enemy is Wei Chen, who is an immigrant came a lot later. Uh, Vera has the same dynamic. So she has these two characters in her book. Um, one is the child of Russian immigrants and the other is a Russian immigrant. Mm-hmm. 
So really, that's a um, that's really good, like to cover uh, kind of the even like the the issues that arise within uh, immigrant populations in that way. Um, uh, so let's talk about boxers and saints then. What are some of the some of the tough topics that you deal with in boxers and saints? Boxers and saints is definitely the the most violent book that I've ever done. You know, I. I um, got interested in the Boxer Rebellion in the year 2000. I grew up in a Chinese Catholic community. Uh, and um, in the year 2000, the Roman Catholic Church canonized a group of Chinese Catholic saints. So it was the very first time that that's ever happened for Chinese citizens. Mm -hmm. So the church that I grew up in, they uh, really freaked out. There were all sorts of celebrations and special ceremonies. Uh -huh. and, and a lot of the festivities inspired me to look into the lives of these canonized saints. What I discovered was that many of them were killed during the Boxer Rebellion. They were killed, which was a war that was fought on Chinese soil in the year 1900. And the, they were killed specifically because they were Chinese folks who had embraced like a Western faith, you know? And, um, and immediately I, I felt a, a connection to that idea of, of building your identity from two disparate places or from two disparate cultures um, mm -hmm. and I, I mean there's there's a I, I feel like there's a there's a there's a there's a weirdness to that dynamic that I didn't fully explore in in boxers and saints that I wonder if I can do in a future book because because now there's this there's this really important conversation that we're having about cultural appropriation right um, yeah. but um, but there's a I mean there's a side of that that I just, I wonder about like, so for instance, for these, for these Chinese Christians, you know, um, a lot of them actually used, like a, a lot of them were outsiders within Chinese society. And, and what they were doing with that Western religion was they were trying to find some other culture that would give them a feeling of belonging because they couldn't find it in the culture that they were born in. Right. And, and, mm -hmm. and like when, when I was reading about that in these books about the Boxer Rebellion, I immediately thought I was a high school teacher at the time. So I immediately thought of our anime club, you know, our anime club, it's, it's a bunch of kids that are all from different cultural backgrounds, but I got to tell you a lot of them, like a lot of them, the, the, they're the kinds of kids that you look at and you know, they're going to grow up to be awesome adults. Meaning they're kind of awkward as kids, right? <laughs> and you know that they kind of, they probably don't fit in perfectly well in, in school society. And what they were doing, I saw as taking, like trying to find a place for themselves, using tools given to them by the stories of another culture. Mm -hmm. So um, with boxers in particular, um, that volume in particular, um, you know, as I understand it, part of the decision you did, like decision making process and deciding to do two volumes versus trying to do the two stories in one volume was to look at Bao, whose actions are very much terroristic, um, and trying to present a more kind of balanced image of this or uh, of this character. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of trying to to present? a character who's doing terrible things and but in a balanced way yeah i mean the danger there is that you hope that you're not inspiring something horrific right by building uh sympathy for a character that is doing something horrific so my my hope in in that book is that you can understand why he's doing it but still believe that it's wrong that that's mm -hmm. that's the hope um I, I think it's. I think it really is important for us to remember the humanity of um, people that aren't like us, or, or 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 people that we may even think are are heinous in in some way. You know, I, I, and I think um, I think what one of the benefits of doing that is that you recognize that you have that same capacity within yourself, um, and and um, and holding on to that truth. Will, will make it less likely for you to move in that direction. And, and the other thing is, I, I do think that it's, it doesn't always work, but I do think that um, it sometimes works to, to build a bridge between you and somebody who you think of as an enemy, as a, as a way of like affecting change, you know? Yeah, and I think, uh, and, you know, I would just add, um, boxers and saints is generally recommended for using grades 11 and higher. Um, as an educational tool and uh, with boxers in particular which you have an opportunity there you talk about 
you don't want to inspire anybody to um, terrorism. And this is an opportunity where teachers can foster a discussion about um, why someone might take these steps and, and what a more kind of healthy response might have been. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, it, it also gives us a, a chance to talk about the environment that fosters yeah. terrorism, right? Like, well, yeah. one of the things that struck me as I was researching for Boxers and Saints is just how many parallels there are between um, what happened in China at that time and what's happening in the Middle East now. And, and even also what happened um, with Native American ghost dancers, maybe in the, in the mid to late 1800s. You know, when, when, a, when a culture begins to feel existential, existentially threatened, sometimes these really weird, at, at least to the modern mind, weird spiritual beliefs come out. And then you start getting these extreme actions. Um, so I, I hope that Boston and the Saints will bring about that discussion as well. It's not, it, it, I mean, I, I, without taking away the, the personal onus of the characters that are doing heinous things, I think it is also uh, important to look at the, their environment and how their environment kind of encourages certain kinds of behavior. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so uh, let's go on to, uh, to one of your series. It's uh, you know, qu not quite so heavy. Let's talk a little bit about secret <laughs> coders. And, uh, and how that can be used as a tool to, to help students get into computer programming. Yeah, I, I taught computer science for, for 17 years uh, at the high school level. I taught at a high school in Oakland, California, and I really loved it. I had a hard time leaving that job. So I left in 2015. I left because um, DC Comics offered me the chance to write Superman. That's not something a nerd can turn down. And I couldn't do both. <laughs> So I ended up leaving my, my teaching position. But I've always wanted to continue to teach computer science, and that's what Secret mm -hmm. Commerce is. Uh, I teamed up with a friend of mine named Mike Holmes, super talented cartoonist. He worked on Adventure Time, the Adventure Time comics, before teaming yeah. up with me. And he's working on a whole bunch of his own projects right now that all look amazing. But we did six volumes. We are trying to introduce the fundamentals of computer science to kids through comics. One of the things I love about comics is that there are certain topics that are best explained through sequential still images. Uh, one of the most common examples of this are those instructions that you get with Lego sets. Like there's no way you can give those instructions through just pure prose, right? It's just impossible. <laughs> you have no pictures to work with. It's impossible to do that. Uh, and and there, there are topics in every subject that you teach at, in school where still pictures in sequence is the best way to present the material. I, I wanna ask you, I know you're from a STEM background. Have you found that to be true as well in education settings? Yeah, I actually, so went back in my, uh, my evil, evil textbook days, um, the parts of the textbooks that I really liked working on were the parts where I got to create visual images to help students understand concepts. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, we had certain strictures on what we could do. I couldn't make a comic. <laughs> they wouldn't let me. But, um, you know, you did try to kind of create an image that would put things into steps that make it easier for students to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, uh, you know, they found repeatedly uh, in studies that when you combine images and words together, not just putting words on an image, but using them together to tell a story, um, student recall is much better. Mm. Um, so basically, you know, one of the most effective uh, recall tools is, is a comic. And so even if we can't create comics ourselves as educators, we can encourage students to write their own little comic about a concept they're struggling with, and it might benefit them to, to recall the concept. Um, and, uh, you know, the, Science comics, there, there are more and more science comics out there, and we're starting to, you know, come to the reality of having to deal with education standards in conjunction with science comics. And I think uh, we're going to see more of it as we go forward in education. At least I, I hope so. Yeah, I think we are. I think we are. My wife is Korean American, and she still has family in Korea. So a few years ago, we got to visit uh, her family in Seoul and mm -hmm. went to a, a bookstore during that trip. And in that Korean bookstore, there's actually this giant shelf that's full of educational manga, you know, manhwa. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, when I saw it, I was struck by it. Um, I, I know that um, it's like the Koreans who live in Seoul, the, the families who live in Seoul, they deeply care about education, right? Which is why they have figured out that you can use 
at comics for educational purposes. And, and when I saw that bookshelf, I just wondered why we don't have that same thing in America. And I think now we're finally building it. That trip was, I don't know, it was like eight years ago, maybe. Just now, I think we're finally building it. All right, well, let's talk a little bit, um, you know, do you have recommendations for comics um, that deal with tough topics that help people learn empathy, that help with tolerance? Are there comics that stand out to you? Yeah, yeah, I made a list, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this, this one, Summer, was a, was a big one for me. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I think yeah, that's it, one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, especially, like, as, as, a, as a guy, there, there are many, many things that that book open my eyes to. And, and I think Real Friends um, did the same thing for me. Like the, mm -hmm. the, the way um, Shannon Hale and Lee Wood Pham are able to talk about uh, like friendships, the complexities of friendships, they do it in a way that's both harsh and gentle, you know, that mm -hmm. I found absolutely, um, absolutely fascinating. Um, there's, a, there's a book right now called Bitter Root, it's a superhero book that I think is probably the best superhero book that's being published right now. Um, it's out from Image Comics. Uh, it's from the same creative team that did the uh, Power Man and Iron Fist reboot a few years ago. It's an all African American creative team. And the, the story itself is actually set during the jazz age. And the conceit of the book is that um, like hate turns you into a monster. So all of these clan members get infected with this, it's almost like a virus that turns mm -hmm. these monsters and the only thing that can heal them are, is this potion that um, a, a family of African-American herbalists creates. It's, it's just, a, it's a really well done book. It's, and it's, it's totally fascinating. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. I'm gonna be adding that to my list now. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Let me give one more, actually. There's a, okay. there's a book called Honor Girl uh, that's um, done by uh, uh, an artist named Maggie Thrash, and it's loosely autobiographical. It's like, it's autobiophotography. That's what, like, Linda Berry would call it. And um, it's about a young woman coming out in a conservative Christian environment. And I think it's really, it's a very heartfelt book. You could tell it comes from a deep place. But go ahead. <laughs> well, are there any um, are there any books uh, as far as STEM topics go that you would recommend in addition to Secret Coders? Oh yeah, I'm gonna sound like a first second shill. So first second is my primary. <laughs> um, primary well, they do a lot of great they science books. Lines. Yeah, they have a they have a maker comics line and a science comics line, and they're coming out. I, th I don't know if it started yet, but they have a history comics line as well. But those those books are great. There, there's a book um, called uh, Robots by Jersey and, and Drod. That's a, a amazing. Yeah, the, I, th I think all of those books, they got top flight talent to do these hardcore educational books and they turn mm -hmm. out great. Mm -hmm. I would add, um, you talk about uh, um, seeing the Korean manhwa. Uh, there's a lot of um, comics from overseas that um, deal with science topics that are finally getting yeah. translated here. And uh, there's a pair that I'm particularly fond of Darwin and Audubon uh, by a couple of French artists uh, who I'm going to space on, but you know, they're originally published in France, but they've been recently uh, um, translated and released here. And the art is beautiful and it's mm -hmm. very much in the vein of a naturalist's notebook. Um, and it, it lends a story to these two naturalists who form the foundation of many of the scientific concepts we run across. Um, and it, it tells their story in a way that kind of humanizes these individuals we talk about in science class and don't really have a face to put to, aside from whatever painting or they might put it on the page with the uh, paragraph around, about them. So those are a couple of really great books I like to recommend. So let's talk about um, the challenges that comics face. Um, uh, one of the things that you encountered um, as the ambassador for young people's literature is that um, a lot of people came up to you and like, man, all my kids are doing is reading comics. That's, that's all they want to read. Um, so how do you deal with that? What's your response to that? This kind well, of the, derision? Yeah, the, I mean, the first, the first response is they're reading, right? It's awesome yeah. that they're reading. Uh, and, um, and, and, I, and I think that, uh, that the, the, like the habit of reading, the habit of picking up books and, and spending time every day with books is, is super important. 
uh, comics are a great way of doing that. This, this is what I tell to, to teachers a, a lot is I, I think that comics are definitely more than a gateway to reading. You know, they are a medium worthy of study in and of themselves, but they are a gateway to reading. If you have a kid that is a reluctant reader, you got to try a graphic novel on them. It, it's a great way to go. And, and, and the second thing is um, there was a New York Times article that came out several years ago now, maybe 10 years ago now, that talked about how maybe we're going to see the great American graphic novel replace the great American novel. I wonder if some of the fear around comics is about that. Like people are afraid that graphic novels are going to replace prose novels, you know? Yeah. And, and pretty much everybody I know in comics loves prose. We, we're all huge fans of prose, and that is definitely not a, a goal at all of the comic book industry. I think it's, our goal is more, we just want comics to be taken seriously, to be, like we want to take our place alongside poetry and alongside prose. Uh, uh, alongside all of the other literary art forms, you know? So it, if an if, if a educator is really worried or a parent is really worried about their kid only reading graphic novels, I do tell them, try a Reading Without Walls challenge with your kid. See, see what happens. Nice. Well, and, and one of the obstacles we continually face is the idea that comics aren't um, literature. They're not good literature. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're seeing that attitude start to change, but we still run into pockets of it. You know, people are like, oh, comics aren't real reading. And uh, they're wrong, but we have to find a way to nicely tell them they're, they're wrong. And, uh, you know, one of the things we like to point out is that March won the National Book Award. Right. Um, you've been nominated for the National Book Award. Um, comics have won the Pulitzer. Uh -huh. Comics have basically been nominated for or won every major literary prize. And most of that's been in the last 10 or so years. Yes. Um, yes. But the fact is, is there's, there is a comic for anyone, any age group, any interest out there in the world. That's right. um, and that's something we need to, and, and we also need to encourage reading no matter what it is. The more kids read, um, parlays more into whether or not they become lifetime readers yeah. than what they read. Yeah. So forcing them to read Moby Dick isn't going to keep them reading. But if you let them read as many comics as they can lay their hands on, they're probably going to keep reading it well into adulthood and beyond. Yeah, that's a great so, tip. That's a great tip. Um, so uh, let's talk about um, challenges specific to your works. So you had mentioned the stereotypes in American Born Chinese. And can you talk about some of the concerns that have been raised over those stereotypes and how you respond to them? Yeah, I, I, I do have to say that I get protected from a lot of this stuff by my publisher. I feel like I, I only see um, a small percentage of some mm -hmm. of the drama around my books, which I'm very thankful for. I'm very, very thankful for. But you know, the, the concern that I've heard about American War Chinese, in a lot of ways I find legitimate. Like people are worried that by portraying a stereotype on the page, I am perpetuating that stereotype. And that definitely is a danger. That's something that I thought about as I was drawing that book. But, uh, but you know, the, the conclusion I came to is ultimately that stereotype is there. You know, like you don't have to dig very deep into American comics to find stereotypes of Asian Americans. It's just, the, it's just, it's everywhere, you know? And if a, if a student, especially a, a, like a comic book fan, doesn't encounter those stereotypes in my work, they're gonna encounter them somewhere else. And, and the reason why I'm bringing those stereotypes in my work is to break them apart and, and, to, and to pull them down. Like in, in the book, in American Born Chinese, I, I literally behead Cousin Chinky before the book ends. That, that was mm -hmm. one of the most satisfying pages to, to draw, to be honest. So I, I think, um, I think the, the best way of dealing with problematic imagery within our uh, culture is to tackle it head on. And, and to tackle it head on, you have to portray it on the page in a comic. Well, and this is an opportunity for teachers and parents to make it a discussion point. In, yeah. in using the materials uh, for teaching. That's so um, uh, with Boxers and Saints, um, you mentioned that it's violent and uh, yeah. we're getting a lot of <laughs> concerns over violence these yeah. days. Um, so how do you deal with opposition to that kind of content? Yeah, the, the, the violence, it was something that I was actually very uncomfortable drawing. I, I think I'm a really squeamish guy, you know? Like I have a hard time watching Walking Dead, even though I think it's an awesome show. I'm just a really <laughs> Uh, but I felt like I had to draw it because in, in my research, I came across all of these 
photos, like these black and white photos from turn of the century China that captured these really horrific acts of violence. I, I encountered one that was actually a photo of a public beheading and the photo was snapped um, right as the head was falling. It, the head was midair between the body and the uh, ground. And when I saw that I was stunned because like photo, there, there was no point in snap back then, right? Like you really actually have to like, want that photo in order to get it. Um, so that sort of, when I saw that photo, I realized that is how cheap human life was seen to be at that during that era. And I had to get some of that blood onto the page just to be authentic to, to the time period that I was talking about. Um, so it, when, when I explain it like that to, to teachers, they get it, you know, to parents, they get it. They understand that war is not a pretty thing. And, and in a lot of ways, you have to make war not be a pretty thing on, on the page to remain authentic. One of the, um, one of the more unique pushbacks I got for Boxers and Saints was a, a teacher emailed me saying that she wanted to include it in her classroom, but her administration was worried about the mention of menstrual blood in the, in the Boxers volume. So back then, during the Boxer Rebellion, the Chinese actually had this myth that they would tell about the Europeans. So in, in Taoist thinking, there's this idea of the yin and the yang, right? Uh, and the, the yin is female energy, the yang is male energy. And, um, and I, I think in more traditional Taoism, there's a balance between the two. But by the time it got to the, the era of the Boxer Rebellion, there was sort of a corruption within the thinking and, and yin was associated not just with feminine energy, but also with evil. And, um, and there were these rumors that the Europeans would actually capture feminine energy, capture yin, and use it to power their cannons. So they would like smear menstrual blood on their faces and on their weapons as a way of, of uh, upping the yin uh, uh, of what they're doing. So I, I, taught, like, I have one of the characters in Boxers and Saints say that straight up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the administration objected to that. The way we got around that was I actually sent them a citation. <laughs> I, 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 read that, I read that particular fact in a, in a book called Box Rebellion by a university professor named Diana Preston. So I, I sent them like an MLA citation and that solved the problem. <laughs> the book ended up being included in the classroom. <laughs> nice. Um, that's... That's a good thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about an experience uh, that a fellow teacher uh, of yours had that you mentioned, uh, and it had uh, pertained to Fun Home and yeah. the shelving of it in a Catholic school. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, um, I, so I, like I said, I taught uh, at, for, for 17 years at a, at a school in Oakland. It was a Catholic high school. It's actually a very liberal school, especially when it comes to, to Catholic high schools. It's in a, in a very liberal uh, area of Oakland. Um, we did the Laramie Project, for instance, our drama department put on the Laramie Project, and we ended up getting protested by that crazy church. <laughs> I forget the name of it. You know the crazy Isboro? church. Yes, yes. Oh they, actually my gosh. Out, they actually came out and they picketed our, around our, our church, or, I'm sorry, around our school, and, um, and we, had, we had priests on staff at the time, and the priests actually counseled the students on how to avoid contact with them. Because that's how they make money, right? Like if you, if you physically touch them, at least that's what we we're told. If you physically touch them, they'll find some way of suing you. And that's how their, their church got money. So that, that's the kind of community it is. But, um, but there was still concern about Fun Home being on the, on the shelves, not because of the LGBTQ content. It was more because of the graphic nature of a couple of panels within that book. So it... it, 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 it um, it depicts certain acts very graphically in that book, right? And, and there's narrative reasons for that. There's definitely narrative reasons for that, but there was some concern that there'd be, uh, there'd be some pushback for that. So the, the librarian, um, she, we're, we're very good friends. She recognized that that book would serve a segment of the population of the school. So the solution that she came up with was she just left it behind her desk um, and she would make sure that students knew, the students that she felt like would get something out of the book knew that it was there. And if they asked, she would just loan it out outside of the system. So I don't know if that's a perfect solution or not, but that, that's a solution that I've seen. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. 
So ideally, um, a book would be freely available. Fun Home would be freely available, but um, as educators and librarians, we need to weigh the needs of the community against the values of the community. And in some communities, um, you know, keeping something freely available is going to lead to a challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, the one thing that um, we want to remind educators and librarians of constantly is that you have resources to turn to when you have a book that you, you're not sure how to shelve it, you're not sure how to use it. You can turn to CBLDF. Um, we've given out a lot of information about how to handle a challenge, why a book should be in a library, why it should be in a classroom. Um, there are fellow teachers and librarians who will share information. Um, so there are resources there if you have a book that you're not, that you're not sure what to do with. Um, when you're trying to serve the needs of the minority in a community that you might run into opposition, it is possible to make it work. And, it, you know, in the case of the teacher with Fun Home, she found a way to make it work. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not necessarily the best way to do it, but it is a way to do it, and it's making sure that the book is still available. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a constant issue with comics as well when you get pushed back on a few panels. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In the case of Persepolis, they tried to remove it from the Chicago school system because of two panels depicting torture. Mm -hmm. And it was just two images in the book. Um, I think there's some concern over language, but there's usually generally less concern over language than there is over images uh, when it comes to comics, because it's so easy to pick out an objectionable yeah. image, yeah. Um, as opposed to prose, where it's a lot harder to, to, to find something you find objectionable, because you actually have to read the word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's and that's one thing is, uh, you know, when people are confronting a challenge or when they are trying to figure out how to, how to shelve and make a book available, you need to consider the entire work. And when yeah. people come up to you with a challenge, remind them they need to consider the entire work. They can't um, target it just for an image. They need to read the entire book. And often when somebody reads the entire book, they back down. Mm. So, but again, just to, you know, there are resources. If you have questions, you can email info at cblbf.org. Um, if you uh, have a challenge, do the same and uh, we'll be there to help you out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all right, so we should probably go into Q&A for uh, soon, uh, but before we do, Gene, can you talk a little bit about what you're working on right now? Yeah, sure. I, I'm doing a monthly book for DC Comics called The Terrifics. I just finished a book about a high school basketball team called Dragon Hoops for First Second. That'll be out in uh, March of 2020. And I'm also doing a book for DC Comics Zoom line, which is their middle grade readers line called Superman Smashes the Klan, which is a retelling of a famous storyline from the 1940s Superman radio show where he takes on the Ku Klux Klan. Nice. Uh, so in working on S Superman Smashes the Klan, especially considering the current political atmosphere, were you at all concerned about blowback on that? Um, did you find yourself... Um, trying to tell the story in a different way or in a way that might be more palatable for somebody who's going to freak out about it? Ah, <laughs> uh, no. I mean, the bones are already there, right? Like the bones were yeah. laid down in, in, in the 1940s. Uh, I, I think, um, I think a lot of, like, I, I think I want to use the past to talk about the present. Definitely. I, mm -hmm. I'm not, to be honest, I'm not really concerned about, about pushback because mm -hmm. I feel like, it's not, I'm not, like, it's not even a new story. I'm just retelling this old, old story kind of that, that talks about American ideals, you know? Mm -hmm. when, can, uh, when can we pick up a copy of Superman's Smashes the Clan? I'm hoping before the end of the year. But we're, st I mean, we're still working on it. Yeah, there'll be three volumes. Uh, I'm doing it with Guru Hiru, who I did the Avatar comics with. Mm -hmm. I'm excited nice. about it. <laughs> I'm excited as well. So, all right, uh, we're going to go into Q&A if y'all want to start putting your questions in the Q&A screen. Um, as you're doing that, uh, I just want to point out again, if you need help with anything, email info at cbldf.org. Um, we also have teaching guides for several of Jean's books on the website. Uh, we're going to be having future webinars. Uh, next week, there's a webinar for uh, retailers, and we're going to have um, a webinar in June about LGBTQ comics. And a webinar coming up about specific to teaching tough topics with comics. 
Um, also, if you want to support CBLDF, one of the best ways to do that is to become a member. Membership starts at $30, so it's very affordable. Uh, and it is, we take that money and we use that to help defend comics um, and to do the important work of preaching the gospel of comics. So with that, let's take a look for questions. All right. All right, Jean, um, we've got a question from Ellen. What is the most gratifying response you've gotten from readers? Whenever a, a, a young person tells me that um, like reading my comics inspires them to make their own, I feel super happy about it. So that, I mean, I, I think there are all, there, there are a bunch of young cartoonists out there who are already doing really awesome work. And, and I'm very thankful I get to meet them at these school visits and library visits all the time. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right, any more questions? Uh, okay, this question is from Garrison. Uh, so he's got, there's a, his school has a uh, comic club and he's had minimal student attendance and he wants to know if you have any suggestions for boosting or engaging his high school population in reading and discussing comics. Wow, minimal high school. Okay, is it, well, okay, this is just based on my own experience on a, on a high school campus. I wonder if there's a way of tying it with a movie, especially like an, an anime movie. Like you could get uh, an anime and then the graphic novel that inspired it and then do both, like watch the movie, read the, read the manga, and then talk about the, the differences between the two presentations and maybe how that um, points to the strengths and weaknesses of these two different media. Do you have any thoughts on that? Betsy? Uh, actually, um, CBLDF has two book club handbooks. We've got a general book club handbook and we have a handbook specific to manga. So if you check out the website um, and maybe I can get Holly to post a link to, to the website where those handbooks are, uh, you might find some ideas in there as well. Um, also pizza, right? right? Like I remember you, yeah. could just, you could just put out a pizza and then kids would flock to you. <laughs> right? That's actually what I was thinking as well. Um, <laughs> All right, we have a question from Leighton. Um, what do you say to Chinese Americans who did not identify with the main character in American Born Chinese? Well, that's like my kid. That's like my son. I have a 15 year old <laughs> son that, that's that kind of kid. You know, I, I, do, I have had the privilege of going to these different um, communities and, and speaking. And, and it does seem to me that the kids that connect most easily with American born Chinese are the children of immigrants, regardless of where their parents came from. Uh, I, I remember going to a, a community in LA that was predominantly Asian American. Uh, the Asian American kids in that school felt so comfortable that they would switch back and forth between English and their parents' native tongue or their grandparents' native tongue, you know? And, and for a lot of those kids, I don't know if they've ever felt alienated, at least not in that way, not, not culturally. Um, mm -hmm. And for a lot of those kids, they just don't, they don't necessarily relate to what I'm talking about with American War Chinese, which is totally awesome. I think, I think it just points to the fact that um, the Asian American experience is so diverse now. My own son is like that. My son went to a, a predominantly Asian American school and he reads the book and he's like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Leighton. All right. This is a question from Zachary. Um, can you talk to your experiences about the ways in which uh, comics support um, 21st century multimodal modal literacy skills, such as uh, kind of temporal literacy, spatial literacy, visual literacy? Yeah, I, I, I think um, brain studies have found that when you read comics, you process it with a different part of your brain than when you read prose, right? And the modern world is so complex now, information comes at us in all sorts of different forms. We have to be able to process uh, information in different formats, and we have to be able to do it well. Uh, a lot of, I think, what we're seeing in our, our cultural today, a lot of the the, the darker corners of our culture are the result of not being able to process information well. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would add um, uh, that comics are a very useful tool for critical literacy and understanding um, how to evaluate uh, information on platforms like the internet. 
yeah. and uh, on TV that comes at us both facially and verbally. I think comics are a very useful tool in helping students learn how to evaluate the, the content that they're getting from their various platforms uh, as to whether it's reliable, as to whether it's even true. Yeah. Um, I think that comics can be a very useful tool in that. And, and I also think the fact that the images and comics are still gives you a chance to think, right? Like images and movies and on television, they move constantly. Uh, to use comics because they're still, they, they allow you to think about the images in other formats. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this next question is pretty specific. Um, it's from uh, uh, Gerilyn. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, she's a corrections librarian at a medium security prison for adult males. And she's looking for educational titles that our teachers can use in the basic uh, adult ed classes. Uh, can you recommend a publisher or titles? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think that Bitter Root book is, is awesome. I think the Flintstones book is also really good. Have you read oh, the recent book? Really like crazy, <laughs> right? Like people were telling me, oh, the best thing that DC Comics is putting out is the Flintstones book. And I was like, what? But I, I think it, it was a 12 issue series that ended maybe a year and a half ago. Um, I, I think uh, that that's an amazing book. It, it uses the Flintstones franchise to talk about very complex um, topics in very nuanced ways. And it's very accessible too, because it's really funny. Um, let me see. Uh, the Best We Could Do is another book that I, mm -hmm. I recommend. Uh, do you have any for like mm -hmm. an audience? So um, I know that in prison situations, it can be a little sticky as to what books are allowed, um, uh, which is unfortunate. We're seeing a lot of censorship in the prison system now. Um, but I do, uh, I know that when I'm talking to adults who want to get in, uh, into comics and I'm talking to them about their interests, I find that I'm recommending a lot of titles from Image Comics. Yes, yeah. Um, but there is some nudity and some language and some violence in those comics that might prohibit their use in, in uh, prisons, unfortunately. Flintstones is a great recommendation. Um, there's, a, um, there's a lot of stuff from... Uh, that I really like from Fanographics and Drawn and Quarterly. Those are a couple of publishers to look into. Uh, and Abrams, which published uh, The Best We Could Do. Uh, so um, as far as superhero comics go, um, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Mr. Miracle, have you read the recent Mr. Comics? Miracle? Oh yeah, Mr. Miracle, uh, Vision. Was great, Vision uh, was great, yeah, yeah. Great. yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so those are good places to start. Um, a lot of Scott Snyder's work for DC is great. Um, X23, so, X23 is really good. X23, yeah, written by yeah we could go on for forever. And, yeah. uh, um, <laughs> and uh, okay, it looks like more specific to math, biology, history, nonfiction subjects. Okay, so. Okay. Math, math. Um, so math is kind of a hard one. There's not a lot of math books out there. Um, there is a gentleman that does yeah, that. I mean, there is a math comic for adults, like high school kids. Right. What's that? Yeah, Solution Squad. Yeah, for uh, thanks, oh, there's Feynman. There's Feynman. Have you read Feynman? Okay. The Richard Feynman? Oh, yeah, Feynman. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. fact, uh, First Second has done a number of books about scientists. Uh, Feynman, uh, who's the creator on that? He's done a few books about different kind of scientists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim uh, Ottaviani, yeah. We're buddies. Yeah, yeah. yeah he also yeah, did primates. Um, yeah. Primates, which is about. Um, uh, uh, um, there's also a Jane. Is that the Jane Goodall book? That's the Jane Goodall book, right? It's the Jane Goodall book. Um, yeah. History. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of really great history. So you've got March by uh, Congressman John Lewis. Um, you know, there's a there's uh, a book called Nanjing by Ethan Young from Dark Horse Comics. Nanjing. It's set in World War II in China in World War II. Really well done, yeah. Or maybe oh, closed the, right after World War. There's the yeah. Showa manga series, um, which they're pretty big, hefty books, the Showa manga series. Uh, the publisher on that is, I can't remember the publisher on that. Um, so uh, for if you've got um, readers who are having a little more difficulty, uh, Nathan Hale's Hazard, yeah, Hazardous Nathan's Tales um, yeah. are a lot of fun. Um, you know, they, they are for younger readers, but they have something in them that adult readers can appreciate yeah. as well. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, those books are just a lot of fun. Lots of yeah. puns and jokes in those. Yeah, that's right. 
So, and Jerry Lynn, feel free to send us an email. We can send you some more information. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I think we have time for one more quick question if anybody's got one. Okay, all right, well, we just hit the five o'clock mark in, uh, on the Pacific Coast, so I think we can call it a wrap. Um, again, uh, if you guys need anything at all, um, if you have questions um, or if you uh, need some more information about defending books, send us an email at info at cbldf.org.